Imagine you have a patient and you refer him to the implantologist who proceeds to place an implant for the upper right molar. Some months later, you then restore that implant. But unfortunately, this one doesn't go to plan and six months later, you make a diagnosis of peri-implantitis and the implant has officially failed. You potentially have an upset patient on your hands. This patient is potentially pointing some fingers. Now, who should the finger go towards? Should the finger go towards the implant placing dentist or the implant restoring dentist? It's a bit of a medical legal minefield. So I'm joined today by Dr. Joe Bat, who's both an oral surgeon and a prosthodontist. So he's in a great position to be our expert today, as well as Dr. Neil Jeswal, who I rely on so much on anything when it comes to medical legal and indemnity. This episode is CPD eligible on the Protrusive app called Protrusive Guidance. And I think you'll learn a lot about communication, consent, and a proper medical legal management when things go wrong, how they work with each other. So we can benefit and really help our patients because ultimately everything we do is for the benefit of our patients. Dr. Joe Bat, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast for the first time. And Neil Jeswell, welcome again, my friend. Neil, you are the representative of PDI and a clinical dentist that we love having on because your medical legal perspectives are absolutely fantastic and also your years of clinical experience. But Joe, I don't think we've met before properly, so it's great to be introduced by Neil. Joe, tell us about yourself as a practicing dentist. What are your interests? Thank you so much for the invite. I know it came by Neil, but I've heard a lot about you, Jazz. So good to be e-connected finally. I am a dentist. I'm a prosthodontist and an oral surgeon. So I started my life as an oral surgeon, did uh, six, nearly seven years of MaxFax, did my the old time fellowship, the FDS, RCS. And then I went back to dental school and did my specialist prosthodontic training. So I, I did my MCLIN dent and MRD. We were the first batch. I was the first student, my surname beginning with P. I meant that I was a, my first student ever to get a mono specialty training pathway in prosthodontics. So I became a dual specialist in, nine, in 2001. So that's 23 years ago. And we set up a specialist practice. The idea of the specialist practice at that stage was at that time when I set up the practice more than two and a bit decades ago was all the specialist centers were mono specialty training pathway, uh, mono specialty clinics. So you know what this there, there, there was a there was a periodontal mm -hmm. clinic or you could send it to Lister House for endo and so on and so forth. So we were the first ones to set up a, a multidisciplinary one stop shop for specialist referral center. Uh, we had nine specializations under one roof. So uh, 20 odd years ago, yeah. it was a crazy concept. Now there are multiple centers, which which, which are uh, multidisciplinary specialist centers. We are proud still to have all nine specializations under one roof, which is great. They have a great team. So it's a 10 surgery practice. We take about 1,700 referrals a year uh, wow. from 370 dental practices. So it's a well-established practice. We are less known because yeah. we are not on the social media very much. We, everything is done through word of mouth. And uh, we sold to Dentex about 18 months ago. So having run it for as many years as I did, I thought I think I needed to offer the platform for somebody else to uh, take it to the next level up. So uh, we are a successful practice. We are very happy doing what we do. I'm a full-time implant surgeon. That's all I do for the last two and a half decades. And I've gone through various phases of uh, placing and restoring to Pretty much now, I only place implants. So I have a team of prosthodontists with me who restore my implants for me. But this is very unique, yeah. Joe, because I'm very excited now based on what you're saying, because like, I didn't know you were both oral surgeon and prosthodontist. And the reason that excites me, because the topic we're covering today, like I, I'm, I'm very grateful to have your, your specialist knowledge in both the prosthodontic restoring side, but also the surgical side. I guess if I was speaking to someone who's just an oral surgeon, there might be some bias. If I was speaking to someone who is just a prosthodontist, yep. there might be some yep. bias. But yep. I'm really excited to say what, hear, hear what answers as you, you have actually in terms of satisfying you know, from the perspective of both those individuals, if you like. Yeah, we we're fortunate. I think I think we are I think five of us in the UK who are prosthodontists and oral surgeons. So it's a small select group of guys who are nerdy enough to go back to dental school and do, you know, doing one specialist qualification is bad enough. Doing two is a complete uh, a nutcase, you know. So uh, I'm I'm pleased to have Hats done it. You. When I did Someone's it. got to do it. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. So it was me. I had M U G written on my forehead. You know. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. I'm very excited to, to break down our conversation. Uh, Neil, my friend, just for those who haven't listened to our previous episodes about you know indemnity versus insurance or the various yeah. scenarios that we've covered already, just give us a refresher on who you are, Neil. Thanks, Jazz. And, and again, thank you, Joe. Nice to see you again. Joe is such a great guy. Really at what he does. Understated, family man. Always be there for you. Although we tried to arrange Sunday and, and uh, we didn't get back to me, did we? We were trying to arrange a family day out. I know you've been busy. But no, I, I'm a practice owner. I practice in Hertfordshire. 
very much like Joe, my background was going to Frank Spear about 10, 11 years ago and realizing we, you know, we need to link all these specialities together and there's a pathway of doing it the right way. So again, we had probably not nine specialities, maybe four or five, and we've kind of developed that over the years, but still a small family practice. And a couple of years ago, maybe five, six years ago, a lot of my friends were getting in trouble with the GDC for no reason, and indemnity was looking like they were letting people down. So uh, I kind of fell into indemnity, and you know, I really, it's been a, a lovely pathway of helping dentists. That's the way I look at it, and that's what we do. We help dentists at PDI. Amazing. So I'll put the links to PDI and everything as well, as well as Joe, Joe again, I'll ask you again at the end about any teaching, any ref- resources that you have, but we'll be sure to put your websites. And, and, and a little plug that I'm also a, a client of Neil. So, you know, so I, I myself <laughs> am a, a good client. There you go. If someone like Joe is a, a client, then that speaks their volumes, I think, uh, as am I, <laughs> as you guys know. But anyway, scenario, this is a really cool scenario that Neil has written. If there's anything wrong about the scenario, blame Neil. But essentially, a 55-year-old male patient, night shift worker. Now, um, every time I say something, we c- I could let you, Joe, break it down, but there's so much to discuss in this that I- I'm just going to like say what comes to my mind as we go through the scenario. So yeah. I- is- I'm basically thinking, why did Neil put this in? And if I get anything wrong, Neil, you, you just tell me. So 55-year-old mission, so age is important always. You know, The um, younger we are, potentially the, the better we might also integrate, or maybe the decision-making may change in terms of uh, age. Night shift worker, so quality of sleep, that, that might be a detriment here. Non-smoker, which is important. Obviously, smoking, we know, uh, has an impact on your osteointegration. But uh, Joe, you're the expert on that. Upper right first molar. Upper right first molar. So Joe, I'm setting the scene for you. You've seen this already, but I'm just reminding the guests, uh, you, you, you guys, and also the audience about this. So upper right first molar on this 55-year-old male, there's some crowding. The perio is stable. The patient is a snorer, okay? And there is bruxism, so potentially higher occlusal forces, potentially. Now, I'll be interested to ask you, Joe, later about how you may or may not treat a bruxist uh, differently to a non-bruxist kind of thing, if they exist, etc. But we'll talk about that. Now, the dentist refers the patient out to an implantologist doesn't exist but let's let's go with that who successfully places the implant without complication okay a f- patient returns a few months later for the crown fitting okay with the referring dentist okay however 6 months after the crown fit because there's two ways you can do this so the surgery has been done we've waited uh, some time a few months later for the crown to be fit and then six months after the crown's been fit, okay, the implant fails due to peri-implantitis, leaving the patient dissatisfied and wanting compensation. Anything do you want to probe on so far before you go for the individual questions, Joe? No, I think it's pretty pretty explicit. It's quite well written, case study. Well done, so, so that it, and, and, and the good news or the bad news, I suppose, is that it is not a scenario that is uh, alien. It, it happens mm. quite often. Wow. Uh, and it only comes to surface, I suppose, when things go wrong. Because a lot of the training of pretty much all the dentists that we do in implant dentistry is training how to do things right. Not a lot goes into what happens when things go wrong. So when you are sitting and looking at these kind of scenarios, is obviously something has gone wrong. Where do we go from here? So I'll, you know, so from a question point of view, no, I don't have any more to probe. I kind of understand the scenario because I'm well versed with it. Brilliant. And I think the way to think about this, uh, the rest of the episode is, uh, whilst it's good to uh, have some clinical gems in there, like, you know, what kind of uh, restoration was done, screw retain, cement retain, I'm sure we'll go into that and have those little clinical nuggets to reduce our complications. Really, the crux of this episode is the medical legal side, the communication. Uh, Ultimately, it's communication. Ultimately, it's consent. Ultimately, it's how do we liaise and communicate with our colleagues when something like this happens. So that's the the, the mainstay of it. Um, Neil, anything to add now that I've read out the scenario uh, is my interpretations correct in terms of why you included certain factors well i think definitely you know we're all seeing bruxism on the rise we're all seeing sleep apnea on the rise we're seeing our modern diet is appalling so glucose control so when i've seen shift workers they don't sleep well and we know this for a fact generally they don't sleep well and that leads to osa you know we've touched on, touched on this in the past joe and um, jazz so I think there's an element of bruxism, but there's also an element of glucose control. I find shift workers eat very erratically and all at the wrong times. And I'm also going to ask Joe later, like in terms of what does he feel about glucose control and and pre-diabetes in terms of 
managing these and evaluating these patients. So it's good you planted those things in there because this is all systemic health, which is related because ultimately surgery, the results of surgery will be impacted by the patient's health. And the other one uh, commonly is vitamin D, how many of us are lacking vitamin D, which I'm sure Joe's going to talk about kind of thing in terms of when we look at the patient factors and medical factors associated with failure, which I'm sure, I'm sure are so vast. Uh, and because we don't know even more details, we don't have radiographs, we kind of have to infer and, and come up with our own scenarios, but ultimately to answer the following questions, which are, number one, how should the dentist deal with the situation of the implant, implant failure and the patient dissatisfaction? Number two, discuss where the responsibility lies of a case of implant failure and patient dissatisfaction, i.e., do we point the finger at the surgeon? Do we point the finger at the, pay, the you know, he who touched it last kind of thing, right? If you, you touch it, you own it. So is it the fact that it was, once it was restored, is it now the prosthodontist or the dentist who placed the crown? Is it their fault? Or, or question three, which is what considerations should a referring dentist look out for regarding the choice of an implant surgeon based on this scenario? Very fascinating, actually. So one at a time. You have an upset patient, Joe, in front of you, not in front of you, but the referring, you know, the dentist is, is the patient's upset because their implant, which they paid some money for and had some surgery for, had some time and money invested into, is now failed. How do you want your dentist to manage the initial part of such a scenario? I only but presume that the patient is obviously going to go back to the referring dentist or to the restoring dentist rather to start with. You know, I've, I've not made any notes about this because I think I want it to be a free expression of how I feel about this case. With regards to dissatisfaction, unsatisfied patient, one of the primary reasons is they were not informed in the first place of the scenarios of what is possible. I wouldn't mind a patient being saddened by an event of an implant failure. A, a dissatisfaction, meaning the satisfaction has been dashed, that means the communication fell apart to start with. Patients often ask us, you know, will this last forever? And my last response always is, you and I don't last forever. Everything has a finite life expectancy. So one has to manage expectations. And this is where we go wrong so often. You know, a statement I make sometimes saying, you know, don't promise them the earth and give them Uranus, you know. So it's very, very important for us to make sure that we promise the right things. Do not over-promise and under-deliver. You're better off under-promising and over-delivering because that is where the issues tend to lie because the patient is dissatisfied because he did not even expect it that it could fail at this early stage. Did not have Joe, any... can I just stop you sure. there? Uh, sure. Because I'm, I'm, firstly, I'm, I'm loving what you're saying and I love that distinction between being saddened, which you would expect anyone to, yeah, yeah, to be sad sure. when, when this yeah. fails, right? But where dissatisfied has different connotation. It means there was a problem with the consent. It was a problem with the communication. And so the next question I will be asking you on this vein is, okay, just like you said, you under-promise, over-deliver, but what kind of actual verbiage do you use your patients in terms of, okay, how likely is this to happen? What happens in the event of that? What kind of conversations do you have beforehand before it even happens? And the reason I say this is because what we're, the theme we're talking about now, you can apply it to a lot of other things in dentistry. For example, specialists and odontics. You, a patient can have a fantastic root canal under a microscope and six months later, they need a tooth out because the root canal failed. Yeah. It can be in all sorts. So we can actually use a similar it, theme. It's, it's the same because scenario. the yes. patient was saddened, but maybe if the patient wasn't told that there was a risk of failure and that, that wasn't made tangible enough for the patient, then they would be dissatisfied. Totally. So tell us about what kind of conversation do you do so that you don't have a dissatisfied patient, but you have a saddened patient. Yeah, I think when people ask me, will this implant fail? And I will always say, in my experience, everything that a human being does on another human being has a failure rate. The question of failure is not if it will fail or not. It is when will it fail? And how much of longevity will I get out of this in my life expectancy? I use all kinds of analogies, including saying the Lord created the teeth for you. If they could fail, what are the chances of something that a human being is doing for you? So we, we have lots of little, little things I use to make sure that nothing is more healthier than a natural tooth. Remember, an implant is not being done as a replacement of a tooth. It's being done as a replacement for a space. Okay, so, so there's a big distinction between the two. You're not giving a like-for-like -like replacement for a tooth. You're just providing the best replacement for a gap. You know, in all the choices of having either dentures or bridge work or, or implants, this is my favorite choice. So we have literature, we have data. And one of the key things that I always show my patients is my own data. I have an Excel spreadsheet going back to 2001 to 2024 of every single implant that I have placed. 
I placed implants since 1996, but from 1996 to 2001, I did not own a computer. So I didn't have any data then. So it was handwritten notes, which I still have it somewhere, but I've lost you know, most of the records. But So I've got data stretching back 23 years of every implant that I have placed. And therefore, when I give data, I quote my own data. I don't quote literature because that is irrelevant. It is probably done in test conditions in a teaching hospital and so on and so forth. So I always make sure that I manage their expectations realistically. I say, it will fail. What are the things that may make it fail? Is if just like your teeth fail because of you know, either lack of maintenance or things that have gone wrong in dentistry, etc. Same things can happen, happen with implants. In other words, if you're not taught how to clean around implants, it will fail. If you develop gum disease, it's bound to fail. Because as you progressively get older, your manual dexterity will fail you. When your manual dexterity starts to fail you, your ability to clean around the implant will start to fail. That's when implants starts to fail. Let's talk about your data, if you don't mind, yeah, Joe. Yeah, like, sure. um, what is your data showing since 2001 to now? Firstly, is it success and survival? And then how do you make those distinctions and uh, how do you, uh, what do you communicate to the patient? Currently, the data is only on uh, survival rather than success because we have, uh, if you look at success, there are so many parameters, so many parameters. Even a loosened crown from, is considered a failure. You know, or, or porcelain fracture anything, could be yeah, a failure. Absolutely. So the, 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 the parameters are too huge for us to record it in a clinical environment, in a dental practice. In teaching hospitals, far easier because they're providing the implants for free for patients, so they are willing to come back for their checkups. You know, here it's a bit more challenging. So it's more to do with survival rather than success. And the data for us that we have in non-smokers, in non periodontal disease patients is 99.6%. So it's very, very high over a 10-year period. Do we follow up all our patients back in our clinic? The answer is no, but we follow it up with a telephone call. So we have a recall set up. So we do our recalls at yearly for the first five years and then five yearly from that point onwards. But of course, those five yearly appointments, sometimes patients turn around saying, I don't have any problem, so I don't want to come. So we record that as patients saying that there was no problem. In other words, the implant is still there. So you have to find your own mechanisms of recording your data. There is no hard and fast rule. There's literature and there's literature, you know? Well, the, the next question I have then yeah. is this scenario that we're talking about, this 55-year-old male, Periimplantitis, and so I'm going to go back to the scenario, and I'm just going to pull it up, right? So he said the implant fails due to periimplantitis. Now, according to the survival criteria, would this go down as actually it succeeded because it will be a positive in the survival data, or was this count as a negative because the implant's still in the jawbone? Interesting distinction here. For me, if the patient got periimplantitis and has a problem as practically the removal of the implant is imminent, then that's a failure. That success has mm -hmm. turned into a failure. That's it. Zero. If that's the only implant you have placed, you have a 100% failure rate. You know, so, uh, you know, well, this is important. The reason I'm saying that is because people make a lot of promises on their implant success rates. You know, the, the people who say that they don't have implant failures, they belong to two, two categories. Either they don't place any implants or they lie. You know, because anybody who places implants knows that there will be failures. It's just how to manage them. So it's the same with any part of dentistry, right? Anything, sure. whether it's endodontics or occlusal appliance therapy, whatever it could be. There's no one going to have 100 percent, and so be, always be careful uh, to people who who claim anything is 100 yeah. percent. So we've already established the whole thing about dissatisfaction and sadding, which I think is this brilliant distinction. Uh, Neil, anything you want to add in terms of in the medical legal space? Have we seen a trend that a lot of the complaints that are coming are they implant related? Or are they not so much in terms of the, because because there's a heavier fees involved often, people might think that, okay, there might be more uh, litigation. From what I've seen is the people doing lots of implants, you know, I mean, when I started doing implants, I was jack of all trades. So I, I placed maybe 50 in my life. And I got to the point where is I need to invest all my time to do this well. So I, I cut back on it. So we're finding a lot of people like Joe who do lots and lots of them. We don't have really any problems with them. And to be fair, they pay a low premium. They're a great risk for us in terms of we don't hear from them and they know how to manage their patients with great communication skills, all those kind of things. You do get the odd blip where there's suddenly a couple of hundred grand payout, you know, for big implant cases, all on fours and that kind of stuff. And what happens in those cases, those dentists then become uninsurable. Some dentists aren't as nice as others and they just think, fine, I'll take one on the chair. I'll just keep going down the route I'm going. But actually, they'll get to a point where nobody wants to insure them and, and they're sort of forced out. So in a way, it's the system encourages good dentists to keep doing what they're doing and it drives out bad dentists. So I generally think 
if you look at ADI, if you look at ITI, if you look at some of the people doing courses, we're really taking implants seriously as a profession and not just dabbling in it so much. So I don't think it's a higher risk. I don't think placing or restoring is a higher risk either way, and we don't charge more for restoring. So I actually think it's a good thing to get into, but I would do it well and devote your time on it. And what I wanted to ask Joe really was, do you have referrals from restoring dentists? Yes. Yeah. But in my experience of 20, now 24, 25 years of staying in the same center, is the number of dentists who restore my implants has significantly gone down. So and why do you think that is? I think I think the initial influx of dentists restoring and somebody else placing in a different center, I'm talking about a different center. Let's, I suppose there has to be a distinction as well on is it being done by a visiting surgeon and restoring in the same center or are you talking about two separate centers? So let's start with two separate centers first, i.e. I'm placing it in my specialist center and they're restoring it in, 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 in general practice is the dentist kind of feels now the, the initial drive came from implant companies implant companies want to, oh we'll get all these dentists to refer to you so and we'll teach them how to restore in their practice it's literally like you know i, I think there's a rule i not that i know much about nhs dentistry where you cannot have two lots of treatment you know or it can be an nhs and a private treatment on the same yeah tooth. the mixing component yeah, exactly yeah. Mm. so so if you're treating the same missing tooth rather with an implant and then one person is doing the surgery, one person is doing the, where does the responsibility lie? Hence the discussion, this, this whole discussion is all about that. So as time has gone on, where people have not had a distinction of where the responsibility lies, my referring dentists are more and more opting to not restore. They say, right, I'm looking after their general dental health. Please feel free to place and restore. And then when it's done, let me know. The number of restoring dentists in our practice out of 370 referring practices, not practitioners who refer to us, uh, the percentage has fallen substantially. I would, if I were to give you a number today, I would say less than 1% of the implants I placed are restored outside of my practice. To give you a comparison, as recently as, well, not recently, as, as uh, 10 years ago, that number would have been closer to 10%. Mm -hmm. 10% down to 1% in 10 years. It's and do you think that's downwards. a good thing, Joe? Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think it's safer? I personally think it's a good thing for one person and one person alone, which is the patient. Because I think at the end of the day, he's the one who's putting his hand in his pocket and paying us for our services. As I say in most of my lectures, when a patient can place a hand in their pocket and give us three grand or four grand for an implant, they can put the same hand in the same pocket and give a grand to a solicitor. You know, so if they can afford me, I promise you they can afford any solicitor. And therefore, I always look at any case as a litigious case just to make sure that I can provide the right level of care. Chaps, for the summary of this question one then, really it's all to do with the initial consent and the initial discussions that you have, and that's all through communication. Communication key. Now, let's say the communication was, obviously it would have to be not good enough to get to a stage where someone is dissatisfied. And so now we have a scenario where the patient is dissatisfied, not just saddened and dissatisfied. They want their money back, something. They're like, this is ridiculous. I've only had it six months. And now you're telling me that this uh, I spent so much time and surgery on this tooth. It now needs to come out because there's been this gum disease around the implant. There's so a question too, as Neil wrote, is where does the responsibility lie in such kind of an implant failure, i.e., is it with the implantologist, in quotation marks, uh, who placed the implant or the restoring dentist? How do you tackle this? From my perspective, it is very, very straightforward. So that before we even communicate with the patient, there should have been absolute perfect communication between the surgeon and the restoring dentist. So before even a first patient is ever seen, we got to establish the responsibility protocol. Who is doing what and any case like this scenario that you just posted, I have no doubt in my mind that both are responsible because there is no way an implant surgeon could say, I gave you a fully integrated implant. Now it has failed. Surely it's your responsibility. An unrestored, an unloaded implant placed into either poor quality of bone or what? even into bone which has you know, no buckle <laughs> shelf, for example, it'll still integrate. But the tooth will only surface when you then start loading it. So as soon as you start loading it, that implant fails, not because the loading was poorly done, but the implant was poorly placed. So the responsibility can lie straight from that corner of initial assessment right up to the final fit 
in a Bruxer, in a how is the occlusal platform of this tooth maintained? There is nothing other than shared responsibility that I would accept on a case like this, because I think just because the implant was integrated at the time of start of restoration uh, implies that the implant was well placed. Mm -hmm. What would you do, Joe, if I, I rang you and said, Joe, the upper right six eye I restored, is patient's kicking off now, can you help me here? Because obviously I can't place the implant, or, so even if you felt it was my responsibility, I'm relying on you. What would you do as my referring implantologist to help me out? This is, this is unfortunately when we stop working with our head and start working with our heart. And we start feeling, uh, in a, uh, and so we should. We are we are a caring profession. Why wouldn't we work with our heart? You know, so we need to work with our heart because we want to convert the dissatisfied customer or patient to then being, you know, singing your praises. So taking them under your wing, say, you know what? I will give you my time for nothing. I'm very happy to replace that implant at no additional cost to you. But of course, I'll communicate that with the referring dentist to say that you know what? As long as you are happy to then do the crown, on top of that, you know, so. Have I done mistakes? You bet. There are tons of mistakes that I've done over the years, but then I've been placing for so many years. I have looked at my own cases that I did, you know, 15, 18 years ago. I looked at the case thinking, oh my God, Joe, but what were you thinking? You know, uh, because at that time, the, the teaching protocols were different compared to what they are today. You know, we were a very, very small handful of people who were placing implants. You know, when I placed my first implant 28 years ago, I think there were about 10 of us in the UK who were placing implants. So it was a very small number. So, but the responsibility has to be joined. But I think that kind of a failure needs to be used as a trigger for the two dentists to get their heads, heads together, to sit down and have an honest heart-to-heart -heart chat to say, you know what, this shouldn't have happened. This implant shouldn't have failed. Here are the protocols that I followed. Here are the protocols that you followed. What could we have done differently? Remember, we do not comment on what went wrong. You know, we, I, whenever I do my teaching, I always talk about what, what did we do right and what will you do differently? It's a more positive spin to a negative uh, result, you know, and what would we do differently? Oh, we could have done this, we could have done this, and we learn from it. If you have a failure and if you don't learn from it, you might as well have not have bothered, you know? So mm -hmm. I think learning from, from your experience is so, so critical. And, and have I placed, you know, inverted commas, free implants for my patients over the years? You bet. You know, because that's been the right thing to do with that because sure. you, you genuinely care for the patient. You but here's, here's the interesting distinction playing devil's advocate, right? The scenario we've pitched you is the dissatisfied patient because obviously something down in the communication didn't go so right. Imagine you do as you do it now with the years of experience you have. You think you've nailed the communication. You've told the patient, look, you're a shift worker and you're a bruxist, you, although you don't smoke, which is brilliant, but there is a real chance that this could fail here, right? And you know there aren't any refunds here. You're paying for my time and expertise. And, and then when it does go wrong, the patient is perhaps unjust unjustifiably dissatisfied they're saddened but they're converting that saddening into dissatisfaction to try and you know reclaim some funds or just uh, this is their way of coping with this scenario now yeah. in that patient would you then also be like oh come on in let's let, let, let's see if we can sort you out or is that now a different scenario let me understand this question better so so you're saying what additional thing would i do just because he is dissatisfied to try and win him over or, or you know, what is the additional? No, let, 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 yeah. I, I think the difference here is you, you've said very, and I love what you said that, you know, from the heart, you, you're going to do an implant and have to restore a dentist. And, and that's a great way to, to help someone, right? But, and thankfully our success rates are high, failures are low. And so when that failure happens, we learn from it and we help the patient out. But the whole thing is that you did your consent and your communication so well at the beginning, yeah. such that the patient should not have an expectation of a free implant. And so you explant it and the patient should pay again really in an ideal world, if it's gonna be like uh, you know, lawyers and that kind of stuff, like, okay, you pay for my time, you pay for my time kind of thing. And so I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is the implant surgeon and the dentist justified to say that actually it's failed? We're sorry, but it's failed, but you know, this is out of our control. If you'd like to have the procedure again, it will be a fee to remove the implant and it'll be a fee to do a new one. Would you like to go ahead or, or not kind of thing? So someone who doesn't want to uh, get, get involved in that. Mm -hmm. I think part of it does, and uh, Neil, also depends upon your loyalty to the center of the business where you're working in. How much of goodwill do you want to create? Uh, you know, being in the same center for as long as I've been, of course, my whole ethos is to create goodwill. And if I'm a visiting surgeon to a, to a center, would I have the same goodwill? I would do, I should do. But is it across the board that every visiting surgeon has the keenness to develop goodwill within a center? Perhaps not. You know, and you know, that's when, that's when it comes to roost. 
you know why do sometimes uh, practices get visiting surgeons come and visit their center because they want to keep the money in the house why is a visiting surgeon coming to visit you of course to earn money you know does he have loyalty to that one center when he's going to say 15 different centers why would he so the loyalty in my opinion with those kind of visiting surgeons genuinely tends to lie with the practice owner why is in a center where the, the surgeon is, see, you know, is embedded and concreted into the floor and the, the wallpaper of the, of the fabric of the building, then, then so the answer is very simple. I would do that free implant because I want to maintain the goodwill within my center. You know, I want it to go back that, God forbid, if the good news spreads from one person to another person, bad news spreads from one person to 10 other, 10 other people. You know, so mm -hmm. I want him to go back and say, you know what, Joe Bart's practice, yes, they, there was a problem with the implant, but he sorted it out for nothing. You know, I would rather take that gesture all day long. I, I've always, always learned very early in my life, you can't win them all, you know? That's fantastic. I appreciate, again, the human side and the care that you're showing is, is fantastic. I think we can all learn from that and, and, and take a, a leaf from that. Neil, what do you feel about the medical legal aspects? Like when something like this happens, do you think someone with uh, Joe's experience, and let's say, Neil, if you were the referring dentist, for example, you both experience your, your great practitioners, in my opinion, and therefore, are you happy just to crack on with it and manage the patient like this just in the textbook way and let's make it right for the patient or do you think this needs to be done as well as informing the intimacy by the way this has happened but we're going to crack on with it you know we're going to look after the patient don't worry sure. so is there, is there any role and responsibility of any of the individuals to actually inform their indemnity or insurance provider at any point is, is this something that services hey guys just jazz interfering here hopefully you're enjoying this episode so far i just want to remind you that if you're in a situation where you're renewing your indemnity or your insurance, do take a look at what Neil has to offer with PDI, that's Professional Dental Indemnity. Both me and Joe Bat are clients of PDI. And I'll be honest with you, the main reason I switched at the beginning was I need to save some money. I mean, indemnity was getting really expensive and I never even had a complaint. So when I discovered the thousands I was saving with insurance, it kind of appealed to me. But I trust Neil a lot and he guided me through the whole process, including when I jumped between different insurance products. And what Neil's taught me is that there is a difference between every insurance product and to be careful not to fall into a trap whereby your previous years may not be covered if you're with the wrong type of cover. Now, if none of this is making sense to you, please understand the difference between indemnity and insurance and listen to episode GF019, that's group function 019, where Dr. Neil Jaswal, we fully explore, he educates me on insurance versus indemnity. And as part of that episode, we encourage you to get a quote. Get a quote using protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance and see how much money you could save by switching to an insurance product. And on top of that, you get hundred pounds off. This is an affiliate link, which means it does support Protrusive, but you're doing it in a way that it saves you thousands as well. And of course, Neil is always happy to help and guide you. He's even on the Protrusive guidance app and you can totally just DM him. Let's now rejoin the rest of this episode. Good question. Yeah, I think that was my you know patient, and you know the kind of patients we have in our practice, we we try and develop long term relationships with them. So you would hope that yes, it's failed, and this is what we're going to do, and Joe's going to come and help me, and we have Joe's going to come and help me because he cares about the patient, but also he cares about our friendship, and he's not going to let me down, and also commercially for him, he wants to get more referrals, and I'm not going to refer to him again if he drops me in it. So generally, I would agree with Joe that we would do the right thing. We'd always want to do the right thing. If we've consented everything and done everything beautifully, should the patient pay? Probably, maybe. But you're opening up a can of worms because if it becomes litigious, the amount of stress you'll go through, the amount of issues it will cause with your family life, with your practice, with all of these things. Some of us have very thick skin. I don't. And I just want to get this sorted, let everyone move on and, and everyone be happy as quickly as possible. But when you're starting to get involved with lawyers and you're waiting for that letter or they'll use a GDC as a weapon and we're going to start looking at everyone notes. And in this scenario, we would be looking at the implant notes to say, was it placed buckly, lingually, was the emergency profile correct? Did they report on their CBCT? Did they get a medical history? You know, there's somewhere there could be a flaw that's going to drop Joe in it. Or same with me, they're going to look at it and say, well, did you discuss whitening? Did you discuss ortho before this implant was placed? Did you, you know, well, you've been remit, you know, you've been remiss there. So it's not going to end up well for either of us, I don't think, even if we've done nothing wrong. There will be something in there that might be pervasive. So we want to look after our patients. I, we work in a small village where Joe works. It's, it is London, but it's a community. It's, you know, it's rural. And with all those referring dentists, as you said, Joe, word gets out. So you want to do the right thing. 
But yeah, if it became Medica legal, there would be a dissection of the notes and it would be me versus Joe on where the blame lied. Or we would share the responsibility. And that's really a matter for the indemnity to get together to figure out how they're going to deal with it. But, oh, it, but you know, it's not you, nice. You two, you, you wouldn't need to necessarily approach. And you, you know, you're very well capable oh, of managing yes. this patient. Yeah. And it, it, there's no need to, to bother an MSA no. say, oh, by the way, this is happening. Because yeah. you guys are very uh, happy to, to help this patient I, I out. would. I would. One, okay. there's no complaint letter. There's a mm-hmm. dissatisfied patient. And we're managing it. Mm-hmm. And if I rang my indemnity company up, which is the same as yours and Joe's, and I said, I've got this patient. This implant's failed. We're managing it really well. I think the patient's on track. If anything happens... I'll let you know. They'll go great. They'll log it. They're not going to hold it against me. They're going to probably think, actually, Neil's a decent chap. He's being really honest with us and he's letting us know what's going on and we'll log it. And if that does develop, there's no issue of me not telling them, oh, you've handled it the wrong way or why did you not do that and not do this? And not to say that they would do that, but informing them get it just makes you look like a better proposition, to be honest. You look honest because we as we know joe we all have failures so you're just saying i am human this has happened and we're dealing with it and they'll go brilliant and it won't come to rise at all if nothing happens and if it does happen they'll be like neil's been really honest with us from the start we're gonna do everything we can to help him so you have to play it by ear now if it's a you know a broken filling i might not tell them because we're managing it but implant has more consequences medical legally and cost wise and, and you know and it and also I guess it depends involved. on the tone of the patient as well. If they're a newer patient, not a long term patient, if they're particularly disgruntled, uh, if it's heading towards potentially a complaint, even though you feel you've done everything but, right, I guess it depends on the character of the patient as well, where where you think this is likely yeah. to go. Yeah, you know your patients, you know how they are, you know if you can communicate with them. You know, I've had some horrible patients where I've told my indemnity I'm not happy about this. We're managing it, but I just want to tell you I don't feel good about it, but luckily nothing happened. So I think you're absolutely right. It's, you know, I've got patients for 10 years who, you know, are my neighbours. They're not going to be different to, you know, working in central London. You've only seen them once and they've flown in from Azerbaijan. It's a different, (laughs) you know, rapport. So I think that's why I like staying in one place and getting to know my, you know, it does make you safer when you when you know your patients. Great. So uh, last question then is, uh, I think you guys covered this already. Like, what should a, a dentist look for in the choice of an implant surgeon to work with? And I think you guys talked about it already, that relationship, that communication, that rapport with your placing dentist and having an understanding, like Joe mentioned, about each other's protocols and helping each other out. Is there anything else, Joe, that you want to mention about that relationship between the referring dentist, so that's, that may be restoring, and, and the placing dentist that may be visiting? I think it's two separate in either way, in either case, I think communication or meeting the person per se and spending time with him, understanding his experience, what he does, you know, can this implant certain guide me because I'm still new in the restoring world? Is he there available for me to communicate with and chat to if there was a problem? And then God forbid, if there's a problem, is he there to help? You know, I think as a referral practitioner, where 95% of the patients I see are referred to me by a dentist, 95%, as high as that. So my client is not a patient. My end product is a satisfied patient. My client is a dentist. So it's quite different. I belong to a very small cohort of, of specialists whose clients surprisingly are dentists much more than they are so, so my mm-hmm. my delivery is at this side. My input is from a different source, you know. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. so so the communication channels. So when this patient implant fails, I would invariably write to the patient, saying, you know, we're so sorry that that you feel, you know, that you're unhappy about the implant failure, but we are here to help you, you know. Nice mm-hmm. kind words to that mm-hmm. effect, saying, please do not worry. I appreciate that you'll be giving us your time, but we will make sure that there are no financial implications to this aspect of the surgery. I would have done that after having communicated with the with the restoring dentist to make sure that patient is being looked after. You know, so mm-hmm. what does one have to do? Is it essential to be a specialist compared to a non-specialist? That's the other thing that I get asked quite often. The answer is no. There are very, very, very skilled implant surgeons who are non-specialists. I don't have a problem. I think I think you know, as long as they are in word commas, well-read, 
you know, well trained in the art of implant dentistry and are able to manage complications. I think it's all well and good. I know implant surgeons who go place implants, but when the failure starts to happen, for some reason, the dentist is not calling on that implant surgeon. They're sending it to a specialist referral center, you know? So in mm -hmm. other words, they were there to take on the good bits. So nearly two days a month, two days a month, Jazz, I am not an implantologist, if there's a term like that. I am a more peculiar term. I'm an explantologist. Two <laughs> days of the month, I'm explanting implants because we are, inverted commas, the dumping ground for implants that have gone wrong. You know, so we are explanting faster than I can blink now because we are the center in the northwest of London, which are taking on so many cases. The number of failing implants being sent to us is... Uh, let me rephrase that. The number of failed implants. I, I remember doing a lecture in, uh, I think it was in Berlin many years ago with Andre Mombelli, who's Mombelli, Professor Mombelli has written the most amount of papers on, on peri-implantitis ever researched. And he was sitting next to me and uh, I think, so how are you handling your peri-implantitis? And how are you handling your failing implants? And his statement to me was, Joe, there is nothing called a failing implant. There's no present continuous tense. Either there's a successful implant or a failed implant. You know, so there's only a past tense or a, you know, or a success. But there is no <laughs> failing implants. Because if once an implant starts to fail, it will only but progress. All you're doing is reducing mm -hmm. the progression of it. But handling, this is what I said earlier, you need to make sure that you are with a person who does not only know how to do things right, but also knows what to do when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. That's where the issue is. Is he able to handle because things will go wrong? It's surgery, it's a human body, it's blood, it's tissues, it's bone grafting, it's anatomical structure, there's sinuses, nerves. There's so many factors to take into and so things will go wrong. Anybody who says otherwise is lying. Is he able to handle that? If this visiting surgeon mm -hmm. comes once a month, I just don't get it when visiting surgeons come once a month. What happens to those patients for that whole month? If there's a day sense of wound, if there is a graft that's failing, if there's an implant that is suppurating, if the who is there to assess that patient? Nobody. Or the implant surgeon, if at best, would say, okay, you can send him to my other clinic somewhere else on the other side of London so that I can have a look at it for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that is not quality of service. You know, not for a patient who's paying awful lot of money. That's a really good uh, point to watch out for in that relationship when you're picking an implant dentist. Now, one reflection is something that I learned from listening to Frank Spear. So Neil, I know you'll be able to resonate as well, is that when something goes wrong, you just want to, you literally just want to go in there and fix it. Like that's your number one aim. It's one of like typical bloke. You just want to just fix it. Okay, what's the problem? When my wife tells me a problem, like, I'm just I don't want I don't want to listen. Which what that's what she wants me to do. I want to go in and fix it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. And I think that serves as well in dentistry. Like you sort of go in and fix things, right? And that, and that and that's that was very clear from our conversation. So that's good. But talking of failure, I think it'll be and I'm really happy with how this episode's gone. I think we covered some great points. But those two bits in the history, I think now we can go a little bit more clinical from the next five minutes is let's talk about, uh, Joe, your opinion uh, and experiences in bruxis patients and how they do to your implants uh, long term uh, and also the impact of obstructive sleep apnea on, on such patients. Any insights you can provide us on those? My philosophy with bruxism is historically the failure of implants in bruxis used to be much higher. Not necessarily from loss of integration, but mainly because of fracture of components, abutments you would fracture, screws would fracture, sometimes implants would fracture. Those days are now behind us because the components are made stronger, the connections are better, the screws are taking much more tensile forces on it. So things are getting stronger. So the number of incidents of fractures compared to even 20 years ago, 15 years ago has reduced dramatically. I tend to do two very, very fundamental basic things. One, keep the cuspal inclines as shallow as I can. Two, I reduce the occlusal table to narrower than what natu the natural teeth are. And three, a, a bite guard of sorts. Okay, those are my, the, the incidence of implant failures in bruxis pretty much these days should be or needs to be close to zero or should be mm -hmm. equitable to what a non-bruxis patient would be because there is so much data on it that we have so many clever things one can do to make sure that it is not even a factor. With regards to other factors, the, you know, the, the sugar contents of your blood, so the sleep apnea aspects of it, all those 
are factors that have a very, very small, but sometimes significant, but very small impact on implant health. I think the generic health problems of, of proper full-fledged diabetes, full-fledged you know, uh, immunosuppression, full-fledged bisphosphonates. Bis so my analogy for any of those patients is anything that is uncontrolled is a no-no. So walk away or at least make sure that you treat. In other words, do I treat patients who are diabetic? Yes, I do. Hypertensive? Yes, I do. I do all, but none of them which have a prefix called uncontrolled. If it's uncontrolled mm -hmm. diabetic, I don't treat. Uncontrolled hypertensive, I don't treat. Uncontrolled psychosis, I don't treat because there are patients who, who, who come with mental health issues. Uncontrolled. So anything that has the prefix uncontrolled. Even the bruxism, if you leave it uncontrolled in a way, you, you, are, you, are, you are shaping it with the bike guard. You're shaping it with the restorative design to get some degree of control over it. You can't stop their behavior, which is brux bruxism is a behavior, but you are influencing how it's it. uh, perceived by the implant. So the well, uncontrolled is critical. Mm. So if a patient comes in, look at the medical history. If they say diabetic, Mrs. Smith, how well controlled is your diabetes? Oh, it's really well controlled. When was the last time you had your blood sugar checked? Because these are all standard questions that we should be doing. We don't need to be super clever and start micro-dissecting medical conditions. Fundamental stories is plenty. And your success rate will shoot off the scale because you've asked some really basic questions. Fantastic. Very, very happy with that. Uh, nice little uh, concise summary. I'm very happy with that. Neil, anything you want to add to our discussion that we've had about the dissatisfied patient? I think we covered a lot of the communication stuff, which I think is the, is the crux of all of our episodes that we do in the medical legal series, Neil, isn't it really? But we had this little blame game thing, but I just love the direction it went in. And I think it speaks volumes about uh, Joe as a, someone who places implants for the referring dentist and how that relationship, if you take anything yeah. away, is to work with someone with that kind of relationship, kind of like what Joe has with his uh, dentist. That's, that's a beautiful thing to have and someone who can rescue you because when the failure happens, it's really nice to have confidence in your implant surgeon that A, they'll be present and B, they'll be um, on your side when that happens, basically. Uh, any additions to that, Neil? I think generally, as we all covered, it's communication, it's the relationship with you and the surgeon and the patient. If you are trying to find a peripatetic surgeon or someone else is placing implants for you, ask them to have a look at their notes. Just do what we would do from an indemnity point of view. Are they writing ISQs? Have they taken PAs, uh, you know, grade A's, as they now called? You know, what are the notes like? Are they recording everything? I've seen lots of notes. CBC taken, no justification, no report. And you just start thinking... I didn't even think about that. That's really good. You know that saying, I, th I forgot who it was, but how you do anything is how you do everything. So so when you see that, their notes are really good, then maybe their surgery is going to be really good and precise and stuff as well. So how, how detailed are they going? Who knows? But this is something if you're working with someone and you know when the proverbial hits the fan and, pe and people's notes are being looked at, you want to see that, okay, that my, you know, my dentist was a, like a partnership, that their yeah. notes are also carrying the weight that, that are worthy of. I mean, and then that's what it will come down to. And it may not be you that gets dropped in it because their notes might be bad, but it's a team. And you don't want to, you want to work together for a better outcome. Joe, would you be offended if I asked you to just, do you mind sending me the patient's notes? Sorry, whose patient's notes? If I asked, oh, just, you know, you placed enough or write six for me, do you mind if you just send me the notes so I can have oh, a look? Oh, I do it No, I do it all the time. There you go. I do there it all are. the time. Nothing to, hide. nothing to hide. There should be nothing to hide. I think that, I think exactly. even when you're picking a visiting surgeon to come in and help you through your surgeries, please do some research on that person. You know, to find out what kind of portfolio of cases does he handle? Does he handle the whole spectrum, including all on force? You know, what kind of experience has he come in? Who has he done work for before? Let him give you the 10 names that he's been to. You will, you're bound to know one of those 10 people. You know, mm -hmm. don't be embarrassed to ask questions like, oh, is there a clinic that you worked in where you have left and not don't work there anymore? You said, yes. Oh, yes, I have two clinics, but I don't go anymore. Why did you leave those clinics? You know, mm -hmm. we want to know what broke down for you to go to a clinic. But two years later, after having placed 30 implants, you have walked away. Right. What made that? This is crucial because the patient will only ever come back to your practice to ask you for your problem, for their problem to be solved. But the surgeon, if he's not there, you know, so, so you've got to do some research. You've got to be able to speak to some of the other clinics that he goes to to say, can you please, if you don't mind, he's planning to come to my practice as well. Can you please tell me a bit about him? How is he with his patients? Why do you mm -hmm. want him to come and place your first implant without even asking? I see this routinely. People don't even ask other dental practices. So how was he with your patients? No, they've got mm. him in on board because somebody may have mentioned a passing name and they want to keep the work in-house. 
That is the mm -hmm. only criteria. Very Due good. diligence. Due yeah. diligence, be selective, and uh, really know the person who's playing uh, placing the implants. Uh, Joe, I'm, I'm just I'm so so privileged to, to, to meet you today and just uh, hear what you have to say, your sayings, your verbiage, your already from this conversation. I, if I ever need an implant, I know where I'm going. <laughs> but, but tell us, where, where, where can we learn from you, my friend? Oh, you know what, fairness? In all the years that I have been doing implant dentistry, my door out here, you know, is an open door. It's anybody and everybody is welcome to spend time with me. We, I have never in my life charged for anybody to come and look over my shoulder, ever. All they do is, Joe, they say specific, oh, I'm just starting off my implant journey. Can I come and see some simple ones? Or oh, I've been my implant journey for many years. I want to take it to the next level. Can I come and look over your shoulder, see you doing a sinus graph or, or, a, you know, or anything a bit more complex? I do run a foundation level modular course at our practice. It's run over five modules. Four of the modules are run in Mopark Center here. We are a 10 surgery practice with a training center upstairs. And one module is normally run abroad. For the last couple of years, I've been running it in Sarajevo in Bosnia because we have a massive international Strauman and Neodent training center there for, um, in the university, the main government university hospital. So that's where we normally run it out of. And we run it normally. And in, any in website the, we can check out. I mean, I'm gonna, I'll put everything in the show notes anyway. So you don't have to tell me now. But if you know it by heart, I know lots of people are looking for great implant mentors and you're in that category. So if you know the website, we're happy to just direct everyone. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, in offense, www.moreparkdental.com is the best place to reach me at. And then mm. I have a model course brochure, which I'm very happy to share. Uh, I take a very, very small cohort of people because I think anything more than six or even eight is, is a crowd. When people run uh, modular courses with 14, 15 people, I genuinely believe quality of education is not as intensive. But if anybody wants to learn anything, I'm here to help. Certainly, and I'm always uh, there to shine a light on great educators and people who are uh, in the profession who've got so much experience. So that's my role to, sh you know, get these people, pick your brains. And so we certainly have done that today. Joe, thank you so much for your time. It's I really pleasure. appreciate it. A I'll pleasure. put all those links in the show notes. And uh, Neil had to go because his battery died. But Neil <laughs> Guys represents PDI, Professional Dental Indemnity. If you need to contact Neil, check him on the Protrusive Guidance app. He's there. You can DM him. But also it's a Neil at ProfessionalDentalIndemnity.co.uk. But again, we'll put all that in the show notes. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Jazz, for the invite. Well, there we have it, guys. Aren't you so impressed by Dr. Joe Bat? Super knowledgeable man, full of wisdom. Now, if you want a certificate to prove that you've gained from this wisdom today, this episode is fully verified one hour of CPD. You just have to answer a few questions on the Protrusive Guidance app and our CPD Queen Marie will send you a certificate. She will send it to you the Wednesday following once you've answered the quiz. And then also quarterly, she'll send you a summary of all the CPD you've gained through Protrusive. And that includes the masterclasses like Verti Prepper Plonkers and Section School, all of the good webinar replays and topics that we've covered before. Do check out www.protrusive.app if you love the podcast and if you want to now formalize the learning that you're doing. I want to thank Neil and Joe once again. I put the links in the show notes. So check out these courses from Joe Bat and also the Indemnity PDI with Dr. Neil Jaiswal. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash insurance. Thanks for listening again. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.